Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this, the first of the uh, special speakers series for 2020 by the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Uh, I am your congenial host, the Executive Director of the Royal Astronomical Society, Phil Groff, and um, I'm here to, to introduce this, our first, uh, our first speaker series. This is uh, one of several online offerings that the RASC is, is offering to its members and, and to others right now. Um, you can join us every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon for our Insider's Guide to the Galaxy um, talks at 3.30 Eastern uh, Daylight Time. Uh, we have a very informative series uh, with the editor of the uh, Observer's Handbook on how to use the Observer's Handbook that's happening every Monday afternoon uh, at 3.30. And every other Wednesday, we are hosting self-isolation star parties. So there's a lot of uh, content out there right now, um, but I'd, uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this a very special occasion, um, our very first speaker session for this, uh, this series of COVID-19 activities. For those of you who are new to um, using the Zoom interface for a webinar, um, at the bottom of your screen, you can see a chat button and another button that um, has your hand. Um, and last but not least, a button that says Q&A. So we're going to ask you to, to put questions you might have in that Q&A button uh, by clicking on it and, and asking your questions in advance so that we can get them all teed up and ready to, to ask our special guest tonight um, when, uh, when we're ready to do those questions at the end of the session. Other discussion you can have with each other using the chat interface. And I see some of you already done so. So I, I see folks are using the, the, uh, the chat there. That's great. All right. So um, without further ado, let me just say this. Uh, is not only a RASC production, we are in fact co-hosting the event tonight with Sky News Magazine. And we have with us to serve as our interlocutor with our speakers tonight, the uh, managing editor of Sky News Magazine, Alendria Burhez. Say hi, Alendria. Hello, good evening. Thank you. And uh, I'm now gonna turn things over because you didn't uh, tune in here to listen to me speak. Uh, to a man who needs almost no introduction to anyone here in the RASC. Um, he's the president of the Mississauga Center. He's my predecessor as the executive director of the society, and he has been active and giving of himself to this society for nearly 50 years. Ladies and gentlemen, I, it is my great pleasure to introduce Randy Atwood. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Landria. And uh, boy, this is a great honor. Uh, let me uh, share my screen, see how that works. Can you see my screen? I can, I can. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is a great opportunity to, uh, to share, uh, you know, my thoughts and feelings uh, about uh, this mission. And uh, the Apollo 13 mission is, uh, uh, it's experiencing a 50th anniversary tonight because uh, about three hours from now is the 50th anniversary to the minute when the Apollo 13 astronauts had their, their problem. And uh, we reached out to Fred Hayes, the lunar module pilot for Apollo 13, who I'd uh, met a couple of times at some conferences. And uh, he is planning to join us after the, my presentation. Uh, we'll have a little chat with him and uh, we may even be able to fire off some questions from the audience. So we're just, you know, this is online, this is Zoom, this is live TV, play it by ear. But uh, let's, uh, let's go. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about the, the pre-mission, uh, getting ready for this particular mission, the, the third uh, launch of people to, uh, to the moon and uh, some of the issues that they had uh, getting up into space. Uh, the accident didn't happen until about three days into the mission. And we'll look uh, at uh, how they decided to, to get the astronauts home. There are lots of different issues that they had to uh, work on in real time. And uh, nobody had any, uh, you know, there wasn't a binder that they could go to to figure out how to get people home. Here's the timeline. Uh, of uh, the, the uh, mission, just to give you an idea, it was launched uh, on uh, April 11th uh, in the afternoon. Uh, it wasn't until Monday night, uh, again, 50 years ago tonight, 
that they had uh, an explosion in one of their oxygen tanks. Uh, at that point, it took them a couple hours to decide that they were in uh, big trouble. Uh, they decided to power up the lunar module, use it as a lifeboat, abort the landing, go around the moon, and uh, get the astronauts home. This required uh, various burns, uh, firings of the lunar module engine uh, to get them on the right trajectory. They went around the moon on Tuesday around uh, 7 p.m., uh, had to fire up the engine again to, to uh, speed up their return. And uh, then they re had problems. They had a buildup of carbon dioxide in the uh, spacecraft. They had to figure out a, a way to remove that. And uh, then after a few more burns and a few more days of uh, enduring the uh, environment in the, in the uh, spacecraft, which was dark and cold because they had to turn off the power to, to get home, uh, they entered on the Friday. And uh, as we all know, the end of the story, they, they made it. So a little bit about the crew selection. Um, this is the Apollo 13 crew, uh, Jim Lovell, Ken Mattingly, and Fred Hayes. This is uh, uh, at least the original crew. And the way crews were decided in Apollo normally, and again, there was always exceptions to the rule, but generally backup crews, each, each mission had a backup crew and the backup crew skipped a few missions and normally became the prime crew for the mission. Uh, so for Apollo 10, there was a backup crew of Cooper, Isley and Mitchell. They should have been uh, the Apollo 13 crew. And uh, Lovell, Anders, and, and Hayes, they actually were the backup crew to the first moon landing, and they should have uh, uh, taken the uh, Apollo 14 mission. The Apollo 13 crew, you know, should have been Cooper, and Mitchell, and Isley, uh, the backup crew to Apollo 10. Uh, but it was interesting, Cooper was an original Mercury astronaut. He was losing interest uh, in, uh, in flying in space. He was actually getting more interested in racing cars. Uh, Mitchell was keen to, to fly. Uh, Isley was on Apollo 7. He didn't impress a lot of people on that mission. Plus, he was going through a divorce. And at that time, that was uh, the, the kiss of death for an, an astronaut. Meanwhile, Alan Shepard showed up. He was the first American astronaut to go into space. Not long after his flight, he was grounded with an inner ear problem. And it took a, a new operation to get him back uh, on flight status and that he showed up around the Apollo 11 mission uh, or just beforehand there and said, put me on a flight. And he, uh, the, uh, he was put actually on the Apollo 13 crew. And then when that uh, went up to NASA headquarters, they said, no, uh, give him more time to train, switch the Apollo 13 and the Apollo 14 crews. So that is how Lovell, Mattingly, and Hayes made it on Apollo 13, because the backup crew of Apollo 10 uh, weren't going to fly, and because Shepard showed up. So it's sort of a serendipity, or you know, the fate that put uh, the Lovell, Mattingly, and Hayes crew on that flight. Here's the backup crew for Apollo 13, and you see John Swigert there was the command module pilot. We're going to see more of him in a minute. So the crew is set, they're training, uh, the Apollo 11 mission is gone. So the, the, the panic to land people uh, for the first time on the moon before the uh, 1969 um, is, uh, is over. We can take the time to, uh, to practice. And, and they were very keen. They were really the first crew that took the uh, lunar ge geology seriously. And uh, you see that there on their Apollo 13 patch. They didn't put the crew names, but they put uh, from the moon science or knowledge. And uh, they focused a lot of time on, on, on uh, learning as much about lunar geology as they could. So here's the command service module for, uh, for this mission. Uh, the command service module is Odyssey. Uh, it's on the right hand side there. That was really, as, as Hay, Fred Hayes calls it, it was really a battleship. That spacecraft was used to get the astronauts out of the Earth's atmosphere on the way to the moon, uh, takes them to the moon uh, and brings them back, re-enters the atmosphere. The lunar module, Aquarius, is uh, really a, a, like a tissue paper spacecraft. It, uh, uh, I actually was inside of a lunar module and it was like standing inside of a, of a pop can. Uh, very, it was only meant to fly in zero gravity a vacuum or a one-sixth gravity. And uh, it essentially is 
only used at the moon, so it's dragged or taken by the command service module to the moon, but it's essentially turned off during the whole flight. The crew was to land in a, an area called Fra Mauro, near Fra Mauro Crater, and uh, the geologists wanted to go there because it was on a, a ray from the Copernicus crater. And they thought that if they landed close to this uh, rather large crater called Cone Crater, they could pick up ejecta from that, which would uh, be samples that would go all the way back to uh, when the moon was formed. On March 25th was the terminal countdown demonstration test. And this is a point where they, uh, uh, essentially load the rocket with all of the fuel. It's a, it's a dress rehearsal or a wet dress rehearsal because it's loaded with fuel. The astronauts uh, go through the whole practice of getting suited up and going out to the pad and uh, go through the whole countdown. And the only thing they don't do is launch. Now, a really strange thing happened that morning uh, before the, uh, the oxygen was loaded onto the Saturn V, uh, security guards had gone out there to clear the pad. And uh, they had been, the, the technicians had been using 39,000 liters of oxygen, uh, gaseous oxygen, uh, to cool down the, uh, the lines to, to run the oxygen into the, the, the rocket. They'd emptied those, uh, all of that oxygen in a drainage ditch. Uh, and normally the wind would just dissipate it. But that morning there was this strange inversion layer that prevented this and these three security cars drove up and uh, the uh, security guards got out of them. They left them running and they walked away from them and they all blew up. And fortunately no one was injured, but I mean, this was the most bizarre thing ever, uh, you know, and this, I, I mean, there are a lot of weird things that happened with this flight and, and this certainly was, was one of them. Meanwhile, four days before the launch, uh, the backup uh, lunar module pilot, Charlie Duke, gets the measles and he exposes the prime crew to the measles. And uh, they begin to see if all of the, the crew has had measles. And uh, Mattingly was the one who uh, had not had measles. And so they begin to look at changing the prime crew. Now, the whole idea about backup crews, uh, you know, they'd only been used once before during a, a Gemini flight because the prime crew was, was killed in a, a plane crash. Uh, but what do you do? Do you replace the entire crew uh, with the backup crew? Well, they couldn't do that because Duke was, uh, was uh, with the measles. And it took for them uh, a few days to decide that Jack Swigert would go on the flight. And uh, they put him in the simulator. They gave him a, 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 just a rigorous test. And uh, uh, they decided to, to send him on the flight. They quickly put together a new plaque for the lunar module uh, leg with his name on it. So they were attending to all those details. So the day before the flight, here's the Toronto Star, and uh, it has an interesting uh, headline there. This was the day that the Beatles broke up. But in the bottom right hand corner, uh, they still hadn't made the decision. And it wasn't until about nine o'clock that night when they finally decided that uh, they would launch Swigert to the moon. And why didn't they wait a month? Well, you know, they, they had to launch when they did so that they would land at the landing site with the right sun at the right angle. So they couldn't wait a week. They would have to wait a whole month for the moon to go into the, to go into the right place again. Uh, they had all these recovery forces uh, at station in the Pacific. Uh, plus there was some concern that, you know, the rocket's all set to go. What would the effect be if it, if it stood on the launch pad for another month? Um, I don't think the prime crew was happy about it. Mattingly was certainly not happy about it, uh, but uh, they decided to go. This was the third manned space flight to the moon or the moon landing. Uh, the media was beginning to get a little uninterested uh, and, and that's just, I think, human nature. Um, we'll look at the launch. The launch actually had a serious problem that nearly ended the flight right there. Uh, but the first two days out was uh, was pretty, you know, nominal, just no no pr major problems. And the one of the capsule communicators told the crew that we're bored to tears down here in Mission Control, which was rather prophetic. Uh, but up to about 55 hours into the mission, everything was pretty quiet. So here is the launch of Apollo 13 on uh, Saturday, uh, April 11th. First stage, second stage, third stage, and the instrument unit going to internal power. 
T minus 37 seconds, and our count continues to go well. We'll be looking for an ignition of those five first stage engines at the T minus 8.9 second mark. We've passed T minus 30, T minus 25 seconds, and counting, and Apollo 13 is go. T minus 20 seconds, T minus 20 seconds, and counting. 17, guidance release. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. Ignition sequence has started. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have commit and we have liftoff at 2, 13. The Saturn V building up to 7.6 million pounds of thrust, and it has cleared the tower. So the launch went well. Um, now the first stage burned for about two and a half minutes. The second stage is really used to get the, uh, the main rocket stack up to a, a height of orbit and to a, a speed very close to, uh, to orbital speed. There are five engines on the, the Saturn second stage and uh, there was a problem. One of the engines, the center engine actually shut down nearly two minutes early. And this is a problem, uh, obviously, because it didn't expect this to happen. Um, but the Saturn was designed to be able to uh, recover from this. The other engines could burn a little later. So I've got some video of that. And the thing that impressed me about this is Cronk Walter Cronkite, you know, many of you know space history or whatever, he did all these things. He knew his stuff. He nailed it. He, he you know, this was a really rare thing that happened. And he had information uh, for everyone that, uh, you know, if, if the engines don't have to burn too long and burn all the fuel, they'll still be able to go to the moon. But this was a critical point where if, if it had, uh, the engine had uh, stopped a little earlier, the, the mission wouldn't have been, on, been able to go on. They would have been stuck in, in Earth orbit and they would have had to return to Earth. The uh, first day, 22 miles down Ranch now, the uh, Ecom reports about five minutes. You're looking perfect. Over. Gene Roger. Gene, Gene Roger. Ecom reports that the cabin pressure is sealed at 6.1 pounds, which is normal. Nice, clear. We're now 250 miles downrange, altitude 81 nautical miles. But that, uh, that uh, first stage booster is going to plop down the Atlantic about 402.5 miles. They've got to pinpoint it exactly uh, uh, downrange from here in another five minutes. Shipping has been warned to stay out of the way after some of the Apollo 11 parts dropped on a German ship out in the oh, middle really? of the Atlantic. And uh, five minutes, 30 seconds. Did you hear that the, the uh, look very good on the S4B? Like I can say, it's well, it's just a little bit. And it's resulting in one of the Earth movements. It's a way out. Yes, I don't think it'll drop in just now. Just stand by for a second. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit. Confirming the COI, Roger. Roger, you've got it now, Jim. I bet there's one guy that's too happy. That's mm -hmm. camera mission control. He's putting your remarks here. And then we're all heading back to the one of the better off in the picture. Oh, wait, what are you going to do right now? I'll start training for 16, I'm sure. Yeah. Training for 16, looking for Chuck Berry, the doctor. Okay, Jim, uh, Houston, we don't have a story on why the import out was so early, but the uh, other engines are go and you're go.
Roger. New cutoff time, Niner plus four eight. Okay, so Walter knew his stuff there. The other thing that was interesting is showing Ken Mattingly, who was in Mission Control. Uh, the Apollo 13 movie showing shows Ken Mattingly going into a major pout uh, after not getting the flight and driving his Corvette out to like half a kilometer away from the Saturn V and watching go off. And I just wanted to show that he in fact didn't do that. He was uh, very supportive of the launch and everything. And everything. Uh, so then, anyway, they were into, uh, into Earth orbit. Uh, everything went well. Uh, they got out of Earth orbit on the way to the moon, uh, like the, the previous missions. Um, the only thing that happened on the weekend was uh, Jack Swigert got a little concerned because he forgot in all the, the rush to, uh, to go on the mission, he forgot to file his income tax. So he was a little concerned about uh, having to be, uh, you know, what, what the implications of that would be. On Monday morning, the, the crew got up and this is where Joe Kerwin says the spacecraft's in real good shape as far as we're concerned. We're bored to tears down here. Uh, Monday night, uh, the crew actually gave a tour of the lunar module with a TV show, and uh, but the networks weren't covering it. So one indication of, uh, of you know less interest in in uh, in the mission. Uh, Hayes was in the uh, the LEM, and uh, Lovell and Swigert were in the command module, and uh, Hayes threw this valve in the LEM which makes a, a jarring noise, this, uh, this repress valve. And uh, you'll hear Lovell say, stand by for a minute and then our hearts were in our throats. And the scary thing about this is it's only nine minutes before the, uh, the explosion. So here's the, the uh, tail end of their TV show. Okay, Jim, uh, we're seeing the tape recorder now. And uh, just by the way, how long do you expect to keep the TV on at the Yeah, I got him with the uh, Kevin Reaper now. Every time he does that, our hearts come in our mouth. And uh, Jack, anytime you want to come on TV, we're, uh, we're all good to go. Okay, Jack, Okay, Jim, uh, been a real good TV show. Uh, we think we ought to conclude it from here now. Uh, what do you think? Roger, sounds good. And the new Apollo 13, which everybody there, uh, nice evening. And uh, we're just about ready to close out our convention of Aquarius and get back to a pleasant evening and not a big night. All right, so again, this is nine minutes before the accident. So we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the fuel cells. 
Uh, we'll listen to some audio of uh, what happened uh, in Mission Control when they, they heard of the, uh, the accident. Uh, a main bus undervolt was the problem. There, there are two electrical systems in the command service module, the A and the B. And uh, the, uh, it was essentially a, a, an electrical problem that, uh, that caused that was the accident. This is mission control. And uh, this is where the flight director and all of the different flight controllers are, are sitting. And it's a very uh, formal setup uh, where uh, the flight director is right in the middle and everyone is, is hooked into a, an audio system and can commu communicate with each other. Uh, the lead flight director was Gene Krantz. And he is essentially the conductor of, of the orchestra. Uh, and he talks to all the flight directors and makes decisions. Uh, the uh, person who talks to the astronauts is the capsule communicator. One of them was Joe Kerr when you heard him uh, during the, the launch part. He is the only one, the capsule communicator is the only one who talks to the astronauts. And it's the, light, the flight director who tells the Capcom, the capsule communicator, uh, what to say to the astronauts. And that is just so that we don't have uh, 20 people all trying to, to talk to the crew at once. So Joe was one of the uh, Capcoms and then two other capsule communicators were Vance Brand and uh, Jack Lausma. One of the flight, direct, uh, flight controllers was Cy Liebergott. He was Ecom and you'll hear Ecom and Flight and Guido and you hear all these, uh, you'll hear a myriad of uh, acronyms. He was in charge of electrical and environmental and communications. And because of the, it was a major electrical problem, he was under the gun during this whole thing. Everyone was going to him for answers and I'm afraid uh, he didn't uh, have any right away. Uh, this is a, a view of size uh, display, just to give you an idea what a 1970 computer display looked like in, uh, in mission control. Uh, a whole bunch of uh, acronyms and, and numbers and pressures and temperatures. So again, the, the lunar module and the, and the command service module, the command service module uh, had a, uh, a system of uh, fuel cells, three fuel cells, which generated the electricity for uh, the mission uh, for the command service module. And uh, under it, you'll see oxygen tanks and hydrogen tanks. Here are uh, a couple of the, the three fuel cells inside of one of the bays of the service module. And uh, here's an actual uh, fuel cell, which we saw on our 2017 eclipse trip to Idaho. We went into a museum and lo and behold, there was a fuel cell there, which was kind of neat. So the fuel cell takes uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen and combines it together to generate electricity. And a nice offshoot of that is uh, liquid water uh, to be used by the astronauts. Here's uh, one of the uh, two oxygen tanks. Uh, in, the, uh, in the service module. Uh, the LEM was, was different. Originally, they, they considered fuel cells for the lunar module, but they decided just to go with batteries given the complexity and the cost and the fact that the, they could uh, design batteries to, to last the two days that they were on the surface. So we're gonna go through some of the audio here. Uh, Gene Krantz and, uh, and Cy are here uh, talking a little bit just before, uh, at the end of the TV show, just before the crew beds down for the night. Well, it's been, it's, it's still like a verification in the docking angle because that's what we'll be using for computation on alignments and everything else. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Like, right. um, go ahead, Ecom. Okay, we'll terminate the uh, battery B charge at uh, 55 plus 50. Okay, and uh, at the same time, I'd sure like to have a cryo sterile four tanks. Uh, let's wait till they get settled down a bit more. Roger. All right, so he asked for a cryo stir. He's asking for the fans to be turned on in the uh, oxygen tanks to stir them up a little bit to give them a better idea of how much of the uh, uh, is in the tank. Plus, you might have heard the reference to Comet Bennett. Comet Bennett was in the sky, and the, there was a, the, a plan for the crew to actually use the telescope in the command module to, uh, to look observe the, co the comet uh, at this point. Okay, here's uh, Jack Lausman of the capsule communicator, and he's gonna ask the crew to uh, stir up the cryos, uh, and uh, he will talk to them about the uh, observing Comet Bennett. So again, A and B are the two power systems in the command module, and the first thing that the crew notices is a, a main B undervolt, so that just the, the B system is not getting enough volts. 
Dan, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance to make it there, uh, stir up your cryo tank. In addition, I uh, have a shaft and trunnion. Okay. Or look at the common Senate if you need it. Stand by. Okay, yes, sir, we've had a problem here. Say again, please. Oh, here's the way we've had a problem. Main B bus undervolt. Roger, main B undervolt. Stand by, 13, we're looking at it. All right, now here is Cy, our ECOM, and here is how he heard the initial problem. ECS, you can. You get your stir now on AO2? Okay. Might be. No, it's, that's uh, data. Why don't you, you gotta We're going off the high dean. Right. You got a page update? Well, why don't we read it up to them and that'll serve both purposes. All right. They both have mattered as well as just want you to tell them what page you want in the checklist. Okay. We got more of a problem. Okay, listen, listen, you guys. We've lost uh, fuel cell one and two pressure. We lost the uh, O2 tank two pressure. And temperature. Okay. Stand by. They got a problem. Roger, man, be undervolt. Negative flight. I believe the crew reported. We got a main B undervolt. Okay, fly. We've got some instrumentation flights. Let me let me add them up. Rog. Okay, stand by. Thirteen. We're looking at it. Okay, so Sai is looking at his screen and the numbers are jumbling and he thinks it's an instrumentation problem or a communications problem, and uh, they're just beginning to sort this out. And you'll hear. Uh, Gene uh, Krantz talked to Cy about, you know, providing some information for the crew because they're beginning to flip switches to see what, to try to figure out what's wrong. We need to put a fuel cell on the uh, bus B. Okay. So we like have a lot of instrumentation problems. Go ahead. Hey, you can He's flipping our fuel cells around, Blaine. So well, let's get some recommendations here, Cy, if you got any better ideas. Uh, so Gene is pressing uh, Cy, you know, is it an instrumentation problem? Uh, there were some problems earlier with this tank uh, earlier in the day. The quantity uh, uh, dial had stopped working and, and so they were sort of referring back to that, thinking that it was associated with that problem. Okay, now, is there, do we have instrumentation problems? Well, we lost, a, it does appear we've lost AC bus 2 voltage. Main B is reading uh, uh, four volts, and that effectively takes AC two away from us. Okay. He the, was uh, those pole on board. Uh, yeah, and he reported barber poles on the uh, on the fuel cells on the air to fly. Okay. Next comes one of the greatest uh, quotes in the Apollo program from Gene, asking uh, Cy, like, what? Well, what do we know is what's working on this thing? We're showing a. You got can we review our status here, Cy, and see what we've got from a standpoint of status? What do you think we got in the spacecraft that's good? I love that. Um, so Cy is talking to uh, people in the back room. There's mission control, and there's a whole bunch of support people in the back room, and they're talking about the pressures in the fuel cells. And one of the, the people in the back room says that there might be a pressure problem in two fuel cells simultaneously. And Cy says, that can't be. Yes, he can. Yeah. Why don't we just try fuel cell one on main B by itself to see if that takes. Uh, well, we're showing low O2 pressure on fuel cell one. We're showing low O2 pressure on uh, fuel cell three. Uh, I want to suck out what those fuel cells are doing here. We might have a, uh, a pressure problem in a fuel cell, it looks like. Yeah, see the fuel cell simultaneously. That can't be. I, I can't believe that right off the bat. But, but they're not feeding cars. Yeah, if you believe that N2 pressure, we blew a sphere. So he now 
comes up with the first idea that maybe something uh, blue, a sphere blue, an oxygen sphere. Um, so uh, this is Capcom talking to Lovell, and this is the first uh, uh, sign that uh, Lovell has looked out into the, through a window and seen uh, something venting out into the into space. And, uh, Jack, uh, our own That's Roger Flight. That's the uh, AC problem. Roger. Yeah, that's the AC problem. Roger. 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 And the Fido is in charge of the attitude of the uh, spacecraft. And he's already seen a change in attitude because of their venting something that it's pushing the attitude. Um, so um, uh, Kranz now will, uh, uh, is about 15 minutes af into the, uh, after the accident and Kranz does this amazing thing. He just rallies the troops and sort of focuses them. Okay, now let's everybody keep cool. We got uh, Lynn still attached. The Lynn spacecraft's good. So if we need uh, to get back home, we got Lynn to do a good portion of it with. Okay, let's make sure that we don't do anything that's going to blow our CSM electrical power with the batteries or that will cause us to lose the main or the uh, fuel cell number two. Okay, we want to keep the O2 and that kind of stuff working. We'd like to have our CS, but we got the command module system. So we're in good shape if we need to get home. Let's solve the problem, but let's not make it any worse by guessing. Okay, at this point, uh, Sai suggests to uh, to Gene that they uh, they start to power down because they're losing electrical power. Right. And uh, then, then he suggests that, uh, look, he can't save the fuel cells. You better think about getting in the lab. So fine. You don't want to get fuel cell pumps off, do you? Uh, we can go ahead and turn them off on one. Which one, Dick? Turn off fuel cell one pumps. Okay. We can do that on fuel cell number one flight. Okay, well, let's make sure we don't blow the whole mission. Okay. Flight Econ. Go ahead, Econ. The pressure in O2 tank one is all the way down to 297. You better think about getting in the LEM or using the LEM systems. I'm going to have to power way down. I don't know if I'm going to be able to save the O2 for the third fuel cell, for fuel cell two, rather. So everyone's getting frustrated and uh, Kranz asks uh, Sai if he's making any progress and the, the, his response is no, but it is such a, uh, just a, he just is running out of uh, ideas here. Okay. Any more suggestions and try to pump up O2 tank one pressure? No. Uh, flight, we're gonna hit 100 PSI in an hour and 54 minutes. That's the end right there. Okay, 100 PSI. So an hour and 40 minutes after the accident, this is uh, the decision. Here in mission control, we're looking uh, now looking towards an alternate mission. Swinging around the, the moon and using the uh, lunar module power systems because of the situation that has developed here this evening. We now show a velocity of 3,210 feet per second. This is Apollo controlled Houston. Okay, we have a... Uh... Proceed. So how do we get home? Uh, well, there are several things that need to be focused on. One is the platform, that is where the spacecraft is in space. Uh, the command module information has to somehow get transferred to the lunar module because it's going to be taking over. And then the trajectory to get home. What about the consumables? Do they have enough oxygen, water to get home? And uh, then we'll look at uh, going around the moon and, and, and getting home. So the command module has a system with a telescope and a sextant where they, the astronaut actually focuses on stars and gets them aligned. You know, amateur astronomers would love this. Uh, you know, focuses on the stars and get them in the sextant and the telescope and then tell the computer what they're looking at. And that updates uh, the inertial uh, guidance system. And essentially it knows where it is in space. And as the uh, spacecraft turns, it knows uh, it adjusts and is used for navigation. For trajectory, uh, they were essentially a day away from the moon. Uh, the options were to turn around and fire their engines to get home right away, uh, but they just didn't have the capability to do that. 
but they felt that they had enough consumables to essentially go around the moon and come back. And that would, uh, uh, you know, with, with uh, uh, a plan that they had designed, which was essentially the LEM lifeboat plan, uh, the LEM could probably support three people for four days, even though it was only meant to, supply, uh, to support two people for two days. Uh, it's interesting, the whole lunar life, LEM lifeboat plan had been planned for uh, before. And in fact, during the Apollo 9 mission, they actually fired the LEM engine with the command service module attached. And that is how they were going to get home. So all of this had been tried before. So this was a burn to get them back on a trajectory to go to the Earth. So the, um, the, the trajectory they were on was to get them to their landing site in the most efficient way possible. Um, but if they had not burned their engines, uh, uh, they would have gone around the moon and missed the Earth. So they were, that small burn was meant to, uh, to get them on a trajectory which would automatically take them back to the Earth. I threw in a picture of my scrapbook back from back then, and I remember waking up the next morning and, uh, and seeing this Globe and Mail um, uh, headline and a Toronto Star headline. So uh, things were getting uh, pretty interesting right away. Uh, the consumables weren't, weren't all that bad. They had a lot of oxygen. The main consumable uh, concern was water for drinking, but also for cooling the LEM and power. And uh, right at that point, they were planning to be home in 152 hours. Uh, the consumables could be stretched that long if the LEM was fully powered down, but they had to find a way to get home sooner. So as they went around the moon, they planned for what they called a PC plus two burn or a parasynthian plus two hours burn, which would uh, speed up uh, their trajectory home. One thing they planned to do was to smash the third stage of Apollo 13 into the moon, which they did. And that uh, really set off the Apollo 12 seismometer and told them a lot about the moon. And 10 years ago, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter actually found the crater and uh, took a picture of it. So this is the PC plus two hour burn. And uh, it was about four and a half minutes using the, uh, uh, the lunar module engine. And this was important again to get them home sooner, but also if they didn't do this burn, they would have landed in the Indian Ocean. The problem was all the recovery forces were in the Pacific. So this was to, to get them home for a Pacific landing and to speed them up. What they were doing is they were using to check their attitude and their navigation. They were using uh, views through their, uh, their, there's a telescope on the uh, lunar module for navigation, but also on the commander's window, there's a, a grid. And they were, they lined up on stars and on the moon for these burns, just to ensure that they were in the right attitude for the burn. All right, so after that burn, uh, there was another problem, and that was their, uh, the CO2, the carbon dioxide that they were, they were uh, breathing out, uh, was building up in the spacecraft. And they had enough of these lithium hydroxide canisters to uh, support the full flight in the command service module, and also the lunar module on the surface of the moon, but, but canisters couldn't support three people for four days, and the two can canisters were different sizes. The LEM one was circular and the command module one was uh, a square, a, a, a rectangular. So they had to come up with a, a fix for the crew with the things that they had on board to, uh, to build a, uh, an adapter to feed the air through this uh, uh, lithium hydroxide canister. And uh, if you want to build your own, I saw actually saw a YouTube where a guy was building one, so you can build one in your uh, when you've got some spare time. But this uh, was a major thing that they had to figure out and and uh, and work during the mission. Uh, there was another mid-course correction to adjust the uh, trajectory uh, to make sure that they were going to hit the uh, uh, the entry corridor.
properly for entry. And that only allows about a two degree margin. So it, it had to be precise. Um, and then there was the just living in the, in the spacecraft, being powered down, the command module was, uh, was dark, was cold. Uh, the lunar module was a little bit warmer, probably because of the astronauts' uh, uh, body temperatures. Uh, but uh, it was hard to sleep because the command module was about uh, three or four degrees Celsius. The lunar module was about 10 degrees Celsius and they didn't have any jackets or, or anything to put on to keep them warm. But they had to, had to endure it. Now, another issue that, that came up was this uh, issue with the lunar module uh, and the descent propulsion system. Uh, they used liquid helium to pressurize the fuel to force it into the tank of the uh, to into the engine, and it only was supposed to be used for a couple of days. And over time, the pressure built up because they were using lunar module lo longer than they were supposed to. And you can see the, the the supercritical helium. This is liquid helium that they used. And at one point, it actually blew. Uh, they knew that it was going to blow. There was actually a, a valve that would release to uh, to let it out. But they knew they only were able to use the de descent propulsion system, the big engine on the land, for so long. And once that uh, supercritical helium uh, valve blew, then uh, then they couldn't use it anymore. But fortunately, they were at a point where they could use the 16 uh, remote con uh, uh, control jets on the lunar module. So they're coming into uh, getting close to the Earth. They had one more burn, and uh, they lined the sun up and uh, the Earth into their, uh, into their alignment, and they were able to, uh, to make the burn. So the last 15 hours of the flight were pretty crazy. Um, because they had to set up to jettison the service module, transfer over into the command, turn the, the command module back on. They had been charging its batteries with the uh, power from the lunar module, get into the command module and jettison the limb and then get set up for, uh, for a landing. And uh, this chart looks very busy because it was a very, very busy time. Um, uh, but the, the issue was that the command module had never been turned off before. And now they were turning it on from scratch. Uh, water was everywhere. They had no way, you know, water was just forming on all the instruments. They were using towels to wipe water off. Uh, fortunately, all of the wires were properly insulated, so they didn't have any problems. Uh, but they had to align the platform on the command module and, and do all these things. First thing they did was they got rid of the service module and they were able to take a good look at, uh, at it. We copied that report uh, from Jim Lovell of service module separation at uh, 138 hours, two minutes, eight seconds. And it put all five of the Is that right? Yeah, so they got their first look at the damage on the service module and they could see that uh, an entire panel had been blown off of the side. And uh, this is kind of a fitting photo, the service module drifting away with the moon in the background. Now they had to jettison the lem, so they got out of the lem and uh, closed up the hatch. But with, when they jettisoned the service module, they could use the lunar module jets to pull away. When they jettisoned the lem, they didn't have the capability of firing any jets to move away. They had, so they had to figure out what to do. And a Grumman employee, an engineer, Grumman was the company that built the lem, actually called some University of Toronto aeronautical engineers and asked them, he, he had met one of these guys at a conference apparently, and asked them to come up with an idea, how much pressure of air does there have to be in the tunnel between the command module and lunar module for there to be a separation of two feet per second, but not too much air that when they uh, jettison the limb, that the pressure blows in the hatch and kills the crew. So these guys, you know, did the calculations thinking that there were dozens of other people that had been asked this. And so they did their calculations and, and gave the information to Grumman and they used the, uh, the value and uh, it, was, uh, it was successful. 
So these uh, engineers uh, won an award in 2010 for this, and there's a nice citation from, uh, from Fred Hayes there, basically saying uh, this was another one of the new procedures that had to be implemented on Apollo 13 to assure our safe return. My sincere thanks and congr congratulations on your well-deserved award. And he actually came up to Toronto when the, the, the team uh, received this award uh, about 10, year, 10 years ago. <clears throat> So they jettisoned the, the LEM. They said, thank you, Aquarius, uh, for saving our lives. But again, the, the lunar module didn't have a heat shield, so it burned up in the atmosphere. And they successfully came down in the command module. And it was a normal landing. Splashed down. They were picked up by the recovery crew. And uh, they were the mission was successful. Uh, so a lot of these people had not slept in uh, about four days. And uh, it was uh, an incredible uh, relief, can you be sure? And this is not only um, in mission control, but I know the people at Grumman uh, were all up working, supporting this and North American Rockwell, uh, where they built the command service module. They were uh, all supporting this uh, during the whole flight. After the flight, the crew visited these uh, various contractors. This is the crew at the Grumman site in Long Island and Fred Hayes uh, thanking these uh, Grummies, as he called it. It was interesting as, as, uh, as Hayes spent actually two years spending a lot of time at Grumman. He was uh, overseeing the development of the LEM. So he, uh, he knew the LEM inside and out and he knew a lot of those people already. So after the mission, a uh, great celebration in, in the media. Uh, this is this is interesting, it, and the the fact that this is dated on the day of the splashdown is kind of interesting. This is a, a letter from George Skirla, who was the vice president of Grumman. He was down in Florida, and he went down to Florida and hired sixteen hundred people to process lunar modules starting in about nineteen sixty six, and this was a, an invoice to a vice president at North American Rockwell, the company that built the command service module. And so it's essentially a towing charge. So the lunar module towed the command service module uh, for at a dollar a mile. So they charged $300,000 and a battery charge, air conditioning, room and board, that kind of thing. And uh, so it was, uh, it was a big joke, but uh, um, you know, a nice thing to be able to send. I had a chance to uh, visit George in his uh, home in Long Island. And you see that he has this very nice commemorative thank you from the crew <clears throat> and pieces of the lunar module. And it, it, as they closed up the LEM, Lovell and Hayes must have just grabbed whatever wasn't uh, tied down and brought it home because I know a lot of people have, uh, have souvenirs from, uh, from the lunar module. So what happened? Why, why did this uh, accident happen? Well, there, there was a review board that was set up and they saw that uh, going back to that term uh, terminal countdown demonstration test, when uh, everything was loaded with fuel, the fuel cells were turned on, the oxygen tanks, the hydrogen tanks, and the service module were all loaded up. After that, they wanted to detank the oxygen, uh, oxygen tanks. And oxygen tank one emptied fine, oxygen tank two did not. And uh, they they, what they did is they turned on heaters uh, to uh, essentially hasten unloading it. And ter terminal oxygen tank two had shown some weird, uh, weird history. It had, the uh, oxygen tanks had actually been in the Apollo, Apollo 10 service module. Uh, they had been removed for upgrading and they had been slightly damaged when they were uh, removed. And ever since then, um, oxygen tank two was, uh, was acting weird. So what they did is they applied 65 uh, volts <coughs> to the heaters in the, uh, uh, in the uh, oxygen tank two, not knowing that the, uh, the limit was supposed to be 28 volts. So what that did is it welded shut uh, this uh, thermostat inside the tank, which should have turned off the heater when it got too warm. And they left it on for eight hours to try to boil out the oxygen. And it got about a thousand degrees in there, damaged all the wiring and, and all this other stuff. 
And uh, essentially after that, the, uh, the oxygen tank was a, a bomb sitting waiting to go uh, once it had been uh, filled up again and, and used. So th this was not unknown. And uh, the crew, I, I believe, because I read an article that, that Lovell wrote, and he says, you know, I knew about it and I should have told them to, to replace the darn tank. But the, uh, the, the, the thought was that the ground conditions of unloading the fuel tank was different from what the tank would see in space. And so they decided not to go through the process of, uh, of uh, replacing it. And uh, unbeknownst to them, it was a, a bomb that was uh, waiting to go off. During the, the testing to try to figure out if this in fact was the problem, they were able to reproduce uh, turning on the fan, which had short circuited and essentially uh, caused a fire and uh, caused the oxygen tank to blow up. And this was a, a test. And uh, they even built a simulation of the service module and they simulated the panel being blown off. So they had a pretty good idea of, of what happened. And what's interesting to me is here, here was something that was working out of family, uh, you know, it was not behaving properly. Uh, so similar to the shuttle accidents to be, to be quite honest. And the fact is they let it fly instead of saying, wait, you know, we don't understand what's wrong. Uh, you know, let's fix it before we go ahead. But that's not, that was not the case. So to recover from this uh, for Apollo 14, they redesigned, the service module, put in an extra uh, tank, uh, essentially fixed all the problems uh, as best they could. And Apollo 14 landed uh, uh, about nine months later at the same landing site. Uh, as a result, um, probably as a result of Apollo 13 and budget cuts in 1970, there was still the Vietnam War and, uh, you know, the government was looking for as many ways to uh, to cut back on Apollo. Two missions, uh, two missions were canceled. So Apollo's 18 and 19 were canceled, and so there are only uh, uh, four missions left. I thought I'd spend a few minutes just finishing up here talking about Apollo 13 in in uh, pop culture. Uh, not long after the mission, there was this movie, this ABC uh, TV movie called Houston, We've Got a Problem or uh, Houston uh, Tenemos Un Problema, if, you, if you'd like. Uh, this was, uh, you may re um, recognize Robert Culp there. Uh, it was a recreation of the mission and it was a soap opera and it was a stinker. And it was so bad that even uh, Jim Lovell uh, talked to, said some things about it and it got a little bit of press. <clears throat> so that was 1974. That wasn't the greatest uh, way to remember Apollo 13. But then uh, Apollo 13, the movie came in the mid nineties, Ron Howard's uh, depiction of, uh, of uh, what happened. And uh, Jim Lovell was actually, had a little bit part. He was the uh, uh, commander of the, uh, he acted as the commander of the recovery vessel. Uh, but he said he, he was never a commander, he was a captain. And so that's why he wore, he retired the Navy uh, as a captain. Uh, but I found a picture of him standing beside the, uh, the aircraft command, the Iwo Jima aircraft uh, commander, uh, commander there. So there have been a lot of books written. Uh, there's so much on the internet. Just getting ready for this talk, I was really overwhelmed. Uh, but here are a few books up from my library on uh, on Apollo 13. Plus, uh, Gene Kranz wrote a book. Now, the interesting thing about Apollo 13, the movie, is that uh, uh, Apollo, uh, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, is not what Lovell said, it's we've had a problem. And Gene Kranz is quoted to say failure is not an option, uh, but Gene never said that, but he kind of liked it so much that he put it on his book. So uh, the Apollo 13 movie, it's okay, but uh, you know, there are a lot of things wrong with it. And uh, so if I ever meet Ron Howard, I've got a few things to say to him and I'll leave it as that. Uh, Jim Lovell, Lovell wrote a book about uh, the mission Lost Moon and uh, Cy Liebergott actually wrote a book about uh, Apollo, uh, which is a very interesting read. And it, I, just going through it, it was amazing how many uh, flight controllers had nightmares after the mission and a lot of them were treated for depression. It was, uh, it was brutal. There is a website up right now called Apollo 13 in real time uh, that uh, you know, the, uh, uh, a friend of mine, Ben Feist, 
who lives in Toronto put put together. He's he, there's uh, Apollo in real time has uh, the missions Apollo 11, 13, and 17. But this is a, a real great way to geek out because you can essentially sit for six days, 24 hours a day, and listen to the entire mission, uh, the audio, the video, the pictures. And it's uh, I did a lot of uh, I sat and listened to about 17 hours of this from the uh, accident on and got a really good feel for, uh, for what uh, everybody went through. It's a fantastic resource. There's also an Apollo 13 flight journal, uh, part of the Apollo flight journal. And this has tons of information. It's the transcripts. It has, it's annotated transcripts. So everything is explained and uh, it's a really great resource. I'm gonna finish up with a bit of where are they now? Uh, Jack Swigert uh, did not fly again. Uh, he retired from NASA and became a, uh, he ran for government. He actually ran and became a, uh, a congressman for uh, Colorado in 1982. Uh, unfortunately, uh, within a, a very short period of time, he passed away. Uh, he had uh, cancer, which he did not, uh, not beat. So um, if you're in the Denver airport, uh, you may come across uh, this statue of Jack Swigert. And I should say, you know, that the, the Apollo 13 movie sort of depicts him as a bit of a, a klutz, but he was, I mean, he was an expert on the command module. And, and Jim Lovell said, if there was anyone who had to step into that role, he was the perfect guy. He had written so many procedures uh, on how to, uh, to run the command module that he was just, uh, he was excellent. Uh, All right, right. come on now. Yep. Do we have a visitor? Uh, this is Fred. Hey, how are you? All right, I'm all right. Thanks for joining us. Okay, I'm sorry we couldn't work it uh, with a visual picture, but uh, I'm on on voice, I guess. Well, that's that's fine. We're just uh, I was just closing up. Um, how you been? Uh, I've been fine. Uh, you know, with everybody else, I guess, getting a little bored sitting around home too much. But other than that, I'm fine. <laughs> Well, we should say that, uh, you know, I was going to ask you, where would you be tonight if you weren't sitting at home? Uh, to, tonight, let's see, uh, the 10th, 9th, 10th, I would have, uh, 9th and 10th, I would have been in Biloxi, Mississippi. Huh? And I can't remember if I had any events. I had an event on the 13th. I think it was at Marshall Space Flight Center. Right. So you would have been at Marshall tonight on the 15th. Yeah, right. Right. All right. Well, Fred, if you, I'm just, just thrilled that you joined us. I had a few few questions for you. Um, you know, I, I talked at the beginning at uh, how there was a, uh, a a certain focus of of geology and science on the mission, and you know your your mission patch, um, you know, has from the moon science. Uh, you didn't put the uh, the crew names on there. Can you whose idea was it to focus the mission so much on science? Was it uh, was it all of you, or was it one of you? No, I mean, all of them would have been, uh, you know, they stretched the schedules. We launched every two months uh, up and t up through uh, 11. And uh, so the, there was a little relief for Apollo 12 from July. When July uh, 11 flew, they flew in November. But we had a longer period. We, got, we didn't fly until April of the next year. So we were the first crew really that had enough spare time, if you will, beyond just learning to get do the mission to have some time to do a significant amount of field geology work. And I think that was continued pretty much in that same vogue uh, for the rest of the missions. And in fact, even more, I, I trained again on 16 and, and did a lot more field trips training uh, for 16 than I had for 13. Well, we, we talked a little bit about the crew change. And of course that was uh, the first for Apollo. And I was uh, I was interested when I, I listened to a press conference the night before the the launch how there was some concern about uh, just letting the the hardware sit on the pad for another month and uh, how that might have affected and that really was part of the decision making process was is that how you remember it? Uh, well, I think we we were so late at this time they had already opened the valves to let the fluid. Uh, the propellants get to the RCS uh, valves. So they had okay. been exposed, they had been exposed. And unlike shuttle, uh, those that system back then could not have set, I don't think for a month, uh, wetted, wetted, so to speak. 
and they might have ended up having to change out uh, RCS thrusters. So, uh, you know, the quads even maybe. So I think that was uh, that was the criticality of uh, why not wait a month. Uh, oh, okay. But you know that that kind of defeated the purpose. That's why we trained equally. I I, I trained for eight and eleven, and I'm, I'm assure I assure you I could have flown as well as who flew so, as a backup. So there, okay. there was no reason not to go fly with a backup. You could have changed out the whole crew the week before launch, and it wouldn't have mattered. Okay. Okay. Um, just the, looking at the accident, uh, I, I wonder what, uh, as you went through the troubleshooting, uh, you know, can you sort of step us through your, your, your th thought process, like when it was, a, okay, this is a glitch that we can work through, through, oh, this might have an effect on the landing to, uh oh, this, this might mean I, you know, I don't get home again. Can you sort of walk us through that? Well, I, I knew uh, within the first minute when I got back to the couch, uh, my couch position from the limb where I was cleaning up after a TV show, when I surveyed the gauges and saw that two meters for oxygen tanks, uh, and oxygen tank two in particular, the needles were in the bottom of the gauges fed by different sensors, I knew we had lost that tank. And that meant an abort right then. So I was just sick with my sick of my stomach with disappointment. Uh, I did not think it was life threatening because tank one looked like it was okay, and we had just stayed fully powered up and come home, you know, at that point. Okay, but as as time went on, as things got more serious, uh, well, the second tank was uh, it became clear it has some sort of a leak, uh, a slow leak, but nevertheless we're going to lose tank one. Uh, which other than some brief uh, gaseous pressure tanks we had in reserve, uh, we were going to, uh, certainly the fuel cells were going to all die because they needed that uh, that oxygen supply with hydrogen to produce electricity. So yes, we, if we knew about that time that would, if they could not halt the leak, which is where we spent most of the time during that next hour, was to uh, cycle different things, uh, even shut Dracton valves on the fuel cells we knew were already dead, thinking maybe the leak was through that route, trying everything they could think of on the ground to try to stop the leak in the second tank. And it was about an hour when that, uh, you know, it ran out of ideas and it was clear it was going to completely uh, go dry and the command module was going to die. So that's when we went to the limb to get something else to live off of. Now you had it. I mentioned that you had a, a, uh, extreme, a lot of experience at Grumman, years of experience at Grumman. You knew the LEM inside and out. You're pretty confident in the the capability of the LEM to sustaining you guys for, uh, oh, I guess, another hundred hours or so. No, not instantly. I was not. Uh, we were going to use it beyond its uh, specs. Uh, I, I knew I knew the LEM, and uh, I had I had. Uh, run some consumable numbers for Jim right after the first maneuver. He asked me to see, look at it. And I, at that time, I figured away uh, enough stuff I could uh, turn off. I could get us down about 18 amps. And even at that level, with a longer return then, we had not done the short, the maneuver that shortened the return. Uh, I made it on power, uh, but I did not make it on water. I ran out of water about five hours before entry. And I didn't ever compute oxygen for breathing. We had more oxygen than we needed. And uh, the lithium I did net miss, so that, that was actually the shortest commodity. So no, I figured the vehicle uh, could uh, last to uh, that point, to the point of entry. All right, one and more incidentally, question. all that knowledge I had at Grumman was uh, the only useful part uh, was when we powered up the LEM, I knew enough about the systems I could cut through the, the we had an activation checklist, a book to turn on the LEM, which we would do in lunar orbit, getting ready to go land. And I could more, I uh, say, smartly in coordinating with uh, Jack Lausma and getting a sort of a go from the mission control guys to, to know what pages I could just uh, skip through in the checklist because I knew we wouldn't need, you know, radars or VHF com or whatever. 
So it helped a little bit with the timing of getting the limb up and up to run. Uh, but that's about the only, you know, the, the, the knowledge I had of the limb was down to <laughs> what connectors and what lines chasing shorts and opens during all the testing for over a year. And none of that played into the actual flight. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have any open wires and shorts and whatever to deal with at that, that, that level. And I'm, I'm going to pass you back to, to our, our host here, Phil, because I know we have some questions from our viewers. So, Phil, do you want to take over there or, or Elena? Hello. Um, yeah, hi. Um, so I do have some questions here from the people who are watching. I'm going to go with the first one. Um, it's from Stephen, Stephen Bedingfield. Um, he notes that your Wikipedia article states that you were apprehensive of flying um, when you took your naval avi aviator training um, and that given the space flight is a different environment than aeronautical flight, um, did you experience apprehension about space flight? Okay. No, there was a lot of time between that. Now, th when I, uh, when you, what you're talking about is when I signed up during the Korean War uh, for the Naval Aviation Cadet Program, which was the only program that would lead to a commission. That's why I did that. I'd never been in an airplane before in my life. My apprehension was to, uh, the, a lot of the other uh, uh, classmates uh, in that training had flown light airplanes predominantly, and they talked about things flying that I knew nothing about. So I began to realize during that pre-flight period that, yeah, I was, I'd signed up for something. I was going to have to get in an airplane and fly. Uh, now, when I started flying, no, it was like magic. Uh, in fact, it changed my whole career. Uh, I, I, just, I loved flying so much. I said, I'm not going to be a journalist anymore because that was what I was majoring two years in college was to be a journalist. And I just decided uh, right then that aviation is going to be my career. I wasn't sure what kind of career it was going to be. The space program, of course, I'm talking about 1952, 53. There was no space program. So, uh, but I, I was thinking it was going to be in aviation. And eventually got interested in being a test pilot and went to work for NASA as a test pilot for seven years before testing airplanes before I went into the astronaut program. Um, I have just a quick follow up because I heard in another interview that you mentioned in the lead up to a launch and you were talking specifically about the difference between uh, being a backup crew and a primary crew member. Um, you said you got you get butterflies. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about like that and what's it like to be in the seat strapping in before before the launch. Well, I've, I've tried to give analogs uh, for anybody in sports. Uh, it would, if they say they were in football, it would be uh, right before the kickoff when the game's about to start. Uh, you know, you've prepared and you've worked and trained for a long, long time to uh, do this. And uh, now, the, now the day has finally arrived, you're going to get to, uh, to do what you're trained to do. And so it was more of that kind of a thing. Uh, now, ours, we were damped a little bit. I, I probably would have been higher up there with butterflies uh, had we not gone through the crew change. That put a little damper in that respect. Uh, it was quite unfair, as you can imagine, a horrible disappointment to Ken uh, to go through that where he was pulled off the prime crew. And uh, somewhat unfair to Jack as well, because he didn't have to. He didn't have time to get friends and family to come to the launch. Uh, he didn't get to pack some things he probably would have wanted to take on the mission that we were allowed to take personal items. So uh, you know, was it more of that kind of a thing going on? That was that different, different than our mission than any other mission. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question here from Tim Jaworski. Um, and he asks, how soon after splashdown did you get to meet your family? And what was that like? Uh, I would say it was two days. We, we uh, stayed overnight <clears throat> on the aircraft carrier and we were helicoptered out the next morning to the Samoan Islands. Uh, had some ceremonial things briefly there. And then uh, we were put on an Air Force C-141 transport that took us to Hawaii. 
and uh, we met our wives there because President Nixon with the uh, Air Force One had flown through Houston uh, for ceremonies with the Michigan Control people and picked up our wives and brought them to Hawaii to meet us. So I'm guessing from Splashdown, it was probably like a day and a half or two days where we got to uh, see our wives. Okay. Um, another question here from Diana Phillips. Um, and she's asking um, if after Apollo 13, you ever wanted to go into space again? Well, uh, happily, uh, about one month after we uh, splashed down, Deke Slayton uh, gave me another job. Uh, he asked me to be the backup commander of Apollo 16. Mm -hmm. I backed up, so I backed up John Young. And he had a crew assigned of Jerry Carr and Bill Pogue. And I was really happy. I thought I was going to get to, to uh, maybe make the landing again, because at that time, 19 was the last mission. And uh, we were in training about four to five months. Unfortunately, we were due to the budget uh, cuts, uh, NASA canceled 18 and 19. So I was a second point of disappointment. I'd lost my second chance to uh, go land on the moon. Uh, Jerry Carr and Bill Pogue, uh, Deke moved off to the third Skylab mission to give them a flight. They had, they had never flown. And so we were running out of seats. <laughs> and so he moved them off to Skylab. And I inherited Stu Russo and Ed Mitchell coming off 14 uh, to finish what it turned out was a deadhead uh, crew assignment on Apollo 16. OK, thank you. Um, I'm, I have another question here uh, from Chris Gaynor. Um, he, he's asking about Apollo 14, which went to from, from Morrow, uh, Apollo 13's original target. Uh, he says Shepard and Mitchell didn't make it to the cone crater on their EVA. And do you think that you and Jim L. Lovell would have made it to cone crater? Uh, well, we'll never know. <laughs> I wish uh, I wish I could tell you that we could have. Uh, no, I think uh, some some uh, orientation difficulty as they went on up uh, closer. They also had a lot of trouble. It's unfortunate they they had this uh, cart with wheels that they had to drag along, and I think that it was it actually turned out to be somewhat of an impediment because uh, it kept uh, hanging up on rocks or, or tending to fall over. And uh, what, what that device, which they thought would be an aid, actually, I think, uh, slowed them up uh, in, in making that traverse. I, I incidentally had volunteered to be a Capcom with Jerry Griffin's goal team in Mission Control because that lined me up to be the Capcom when they were doing that EVA, the second EVA. I thought maybe in some way I could be of assistance. Uh, when they were executing that traverse up to Cone Crater that we had trained to do. Uh, it turned out I didn't add much, uh, add much to the help, help them with that uh, journey. But I was surprised how much, uh, how heavy the breathing got and uh, how much workload it was going uphill. And I don't think it was terrifically steep, but there was enough with that pressurized suit which you're working against all the time, no matter what motion you make with your arms or even squeezing to grip something or certainly walking or hopping, you're, you're doing work uh, against that hard suit. And uh, so I, I, I was surprised how, uh, how, how labored they got uh, trying to make it up that, uh, that slope. Thank you. Um, another question here. I from Paul, uh, you had quite an experience with the shuttle program. Can you describe a bit about that adventure? Well, sh shuttle, uh, my experience with shuttle, I, I call it my, uh, the crowning uh, part of my achievement. I actually left the astronaut office and went four years to work for Aaron Cohen, who headed the Orbiter Project Office. And I did that from day one. I, I was on a team that evaluated proposals coming in to help pick which contractor we would choose to build the shuttle. Uh, went into the office. I was in program management through the entire design development. 
uh, and led uh, te- uh, ops team through design reviews, through critical design review on Enterprise, and through preliminary design review on Columbia. Uh, before then, uh, surprisingly and, and gratefully, being appointed to be one of the commander of one of the two crews that were chosen to fly Enterprise. So I got to go back to the astronaut office and do all those early uh, things you do when you're the first first people up. We had actually, uh, for a while, uh, get our simulators to work. Shuttle training aircraft, Joe Engel did most of that work. And our trainers, our, our fixed base, uh, moving base trainer. Uh, I was involved mostly at Palmdale uh, with the testing of Enterprise to get it ready to even move it to Edwards to get ready to fly. Uh, Dick Truly and Bob Crippen did a lot of work on the software with IBM uh, to get to try to get, and that was a very difficult job to get those four computers to stay together. In fact, at a point close to having the move to Edwards, we almost gave up. We could not, we could not get the four set to stay together. We we're thinking of just backing off and flying single string. And finally, the, the IBM release V19 or V21 along there, all at once the, the set was solid. And we never never had the funny problems we were having with it, with the software. So then they get to fly the first flight. So it's kind of a womb to tomb uh, experience where I'd been there from day one uh, when we got it started to now get to fly the first flight. Hey, thank you. Um, do you still have some time for some more questions? Uh, sure. Yep. Go ahead. We still have uh, a few to go through here. Um, unfortunately, we all have a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True story. Um, one question uh, I'm just going to pull up because we were talking about the uh, shuttle. Uh, I'm kind of curious, like, how does a spacecraft handle uh, in comparison to, say, a plane? Like, what's it what's it actually like to fly? Well, well in my experience, of course, it was only ALT. I did not fly at orbital. And actually, I guess no, no one except Joe Engel flew it uh, manually through the entire entry. Uh, so I was flying it more like a subsonic airplane. And uh, it, con- it controlled well. It was obviously a fly-by-wire type system. So the, the nature of its uh, handling qualities, we call it, was obviously uh, greatly affected by the software control system designer and what algorithms were in the soft and the computer and that kind of thing. And it did fly well, uh, very close. It flew better, in fact, than our trainers, like shuttle training aircraft, which was supposedly could emulate the real shuttle. And uh, I, I gave it a pilot rating of like one or two for most of the maneuver, kind of maneuvering we had to do. Uh, and uh, it was uh, sensitive to uh, control in a way because the Elevons, uh, really was sized for a big, bigger, uh, uh, what do call it, dynamic pressure, higher dynamic pressure at higher speeds and up higher. And, you know, up, up to, say, Mach 8 when it, when the rudder became affected. And from there on, it was kind of flying like an airplane. So, uh, and we were flying it, of course, much slower in subsonic flight. Uh, but I'm saying if you had only designed it for subsonic flight, you probably had a less area for the Elevon controls. And I did encounter a PIO, uh, which is a pilot-induced oscillation on the very last flight, flight eight test flight, where we're, I was landing on the runway. I was too intent on hitting a spot on the runway. And my excessive controls and pitch uh, put it into rate limiting. And when that happens, and, and per, pitch had the priority over roll and when I did touch down lightly, it skipped into the air a little bit <clears throat> with a wing uh, going off. And when I tried to stop the roll, I had no control because the roll effectively was locked out. Mm-hmm. And I made another input and nothing happened. The third input, I made a larger input. And about that time, I got control back. So that's what, like now an over control. And I rocked it back and forth a few times. Before Gordo wisely said, uh, get off the controls and let it damp, and I did. And we re-landed the second mm-hmm. time. <laughs> so, wow. uh, 
They changed the software, though. That was one of the, call it, good things. That's why you do test programs, I guess, Mm -hmm. finding that. So never would you be locked out of both pitch and roll. In fact, there was a hierarchy uh, for rate limiting of what controls would be locked out in order, like speed brakes to body flap to uh, elbons. And but no case would roll and pitch ever not have any authority. Mm-hmm. So that was a software change that had been made before we took it orbital. Mm-hmm. Um, we do have a student question here. Um, do you ever see us planting gardens on the moon? Do I ever see us planting gardens on the moon? Well, you gotta, you gotta, for sure, you gotta find some water somewhere. Uh, they say there's ice in some crater, I think, on the North Pole area. Uh, but uh, the, the soil may be fertile enough, uh, but you know, plants aren't going to grow without water, which is the beautiful thing about the Earth and the place we live. There's lots of water. Mm-hmm. Um, another um, kind of forward-looking question. Sorry, it just kind of disappeared here. Um, it's from David Schumann, and he was asking about Artemis and the new race uh, to get uh, back to the moon and how you feel about it. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm helpful. I'm uh, hopeful they continue with, quote, exploration in one way or another, be it to the moon and on, on to Mars. Uh, the key question, of course, for any program, any large program, is will the funding be adequate and continued? Uh, that's always the, the thing you have to deal with uh, in, in the way the U.S. government uh, uh, controls money. It's really year to year. Now, unfortunately, I don't think many people understand when you develop a major program, you have a program plan that has been spent a lot of time. Like for Space Shuttle, I can tell you we spent uh, four years to develop just the requirements to put the request for proposals out to bid to define what we wanted built. Uh, so there's a lot of planning that goes into a major program, and if you uh, don't follow the funding plan that goes with it, you're likely to, uh, to cause problems with the program. In, some, in many cases, schedule slip, ultimately. Um, another future-looking question here. Um, when do you think humans will first land on Mars? And will the payoff of a human landing be worth the expense and the danger? Uh, when do, when do will they land on Mars? I I have no way of predicting because again, the the the, the question again is is uh, funding available, and uh, I, I can't predict that. So you need to talk more to uh, the the next next presidents uh, down the road of of if they and and, and also Congress if they're going to fund it. If they don't fund it, uh, it'll keep going out forever. Uh, or no matter who, or no matter who does it, if they don't properly uh, support it, no, no matter which government. So I can't answer the when. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's worthwhile because uh, exploration in general is uh, something we need to worry about uh, to uh, continue the human race ultimately. Uh, you know, we're sort of passers throughs here, like dinosaurs were. Because mm-hmm. uh, major events have happened, I don't know, five, four or five times uh, of major extinctions. And somewhere along the way, uh, we've we're probably got one set for us. Mm-hmm. But I'd, I'd hope we, while we're here, because we're, we're quite unique, uh, we've been blessed with the right kind of talent that we can explore. We are, we're uh, uniquely uh, first, the only creatures I know of that could do it. I can build a starship, if you will, that can continue to learn and, and work out with it. And to me, it's just a good, a goodness way to uh, expend our resources. Uh, whereas, you know, we annually spend enormous amounts of resources worldwide for potentially uh, uh, hurting ourselves. I'm talking about with wars, which just seem to be almost continuous. So uh, I would say the, uh, the space part of it and exploration is a, a goodness way to use some of our resources. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think this question dovetails nicely into that part there, like with uh, with Cold War treaties soon expiring. And this question comes from uh, Vince McDermott. Uh, 
Um, so with Cold War treaties soon expiring and dozens of new countries entering space and the, also the commercialization of space programs, um, what do you picture manned space programs looking like in the future? Well, obviously the near future uh, will be bountiful for the, uh, the commercial entrants that have come in. Uh, SpaceX has been uh, quite successful and I hope they continue and, and certainly will be there to support the uh, space station uh, through whatever lifetime it has, has left. Uh, it was also, it's also to be a part of uh, Artemis. Uh, as, as to where, how far we go and when depends on, first of all, I think propulsion needs a lot of, hopefully some advancement. Uh, it's a, like take Mars. Mars is a very, very long trip. Uh, to my mind, from just uh, being a test pilot, uh, it's not the kind of trip I would want to make because mo most of that, most of that time will be very boring. Uh, if you take eight months, to, seven or eight months to get there, and there's not much to look at out the window. It's a bunch of dots of light, including Earth, uh, mm -hmm. en route. And uh, the way the world is going with computers, they probably wouldn't let me land it. They'll land it automatically. So. It's not, it's not a test pilot's a game to go to Mars. Uh, but at any rate, uh, it's, a, it's a slow trip. I mean, with the, uh, the capabilities we have in today's uh, propulsion, and certainly to think of going, even if we found a nice planet, you know, one of these uh, so-called uh, eco, eco planets or whatever we keep finding, was bountiful, or even if we talked, could communicate and knew there was well, intelligent people somewhere out there. Right now, we have no way of even considering getting there. Mm. Uh, it's beyond it's beyond any n near term capability. Uh, that's even uh, other than Hollywood movies. That's uh, could be available. So you know we're pretty well limited, and uh, I'll call it the very near term, like a century or two. Uh, to uh, the solar system, and uh, that's unfortunately that's the the way I see it. Okay, we've got a couple. Uh, we've got a, quite a few questions about the Apollo thirteen movie and what you think about it. Um, there's um, one question here in particular. Um, the person is is asking. Uh, she can't understand how you could have the Earth in the the Lem window while you're thrusting the limb descent engine. She, um, she's asking like those two vectors are perpendicular to one another. Um, so I'm wondering if you could explain that bit and also perhaps uh, kind of talk about what you think about the movie. Okay, well, I think it's mad. I'm not quite sure exactly what she's talking about, but there were a number of uh, technical errors. I don't know if you've ever heard of Quest Magazine, uh, which is highly technical, uh, has highly technical articles. I think they ran a contest uh, one time for their readership of errors in the movie, and uh, the winner had uh, over a hundred uh, in oh, the wow. movie. <laughs> and uh, like the paint job on the you know the first stage or the second stage, if the stripes wasn't right, or, you know, I'll call it things I would have obviously never noticed. Uh, so and that's probably one of those. Maybe she she found. Uh, if I look at the movie and just sat back and didn't think about errors, I enjoyed it. Uh, I thought it told a pretty good story of uh, the people in trouble, which we were, and it, it highlighted the teamwork involved, that we didn't just get ourselves back. It took a lot of work of a team, uh, and, it, and it highlighted, of course, Mission Control, and further highlighted only one Mission Control team, Gene Kranz and the white team. On every Apollo mission, there were four teams, four mission mm -hmm. control teams, uh, and uh, and our, in our case, it was it was uh, uh, Krantz was on duty when this happened, but Glenn Lunny took over right in the middle of it with his uh, maroon team, and uh, then we had Milt Wendler and we had Jerry Griffin's gold team, but there were also people beyond that that uh, worked to uh, solve some of these problems. Uh, like the lithium cartridge uh, fix that was done in Bill and Seven uh, with crew systems people, and they actually tested it in a chamber. 
in Building 7 before they pass the procedure back to Mission Control, who, of course, anointed it the right way for flight procedure and passed it up to us to execute. So there was a lot, a lot of people involved, uh, more than the movie could show. I criticized Ron about it, saying he should have showed a couple more people, and he said, well, you can only... You can only handle so many, developing so many characters in a two-hour-plus movie. He said, you just don't have the time. And uh, so that was his explanation of, you know, why he wouldn't have had a larger cast. Now, he had some drama in it that uh, uh, wasn't obviously real. Uh, the crew argument did not happen. If I'd have been in my normal position on a TV show, I would have thrown the switch to cause the electric short. I was over on the right side. And uh, Jim Lovell didn't hug me. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I don't chew gum. I, the throw up was exaggerated. I got a little sick to my stomach, but it was spit up more than a big, big throw up that Bill Paxton staged. I think the line is something uh, about a big breakfast. But... Yeah, right. And... Uh, they, uh, Ron explained that. I was a little critical of you know some of that stuff, and he said, "Well, he said I, I listened to all the air to ground transmissions NASA had given me." He said, and I got through that, and I said, "It never seemed like you ever had a problem." And uh, so he said, "I had to uh, sort of make you more human in some way," and that's so. Uh, that was his additions in the movie that tried to do that. Mm -hmm. um, another question here from the audience um, is uh, what did you what did you take as a keepsake um, like I, I, I did hear in one interview too that you uh, you kept the paper uh, with the kind of quote unquote the back of the envelope calculations that you did um, it was calculating consumables on a power down so uh, this question's from Tim okay the the paper, the, I don't know if his question of the paper I used was just a blank, uh, what we call a burn card. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any blank paper on board, well, except the backs and fronts of checklist mm -hmm. of the books. Uh, so, no, I just used a burn card, and it was really grocery store arithmetic. You know, I knew how many amp hours were in each of the six batteries, and I knew uh, as, as what amps I assumed we could go down to, 18 amps, I assumed, when I turned off the things I knew we could. Mm -hmm. And so it was a matter of just uh, amps and amps hours to get the number of hours our six batteries would last. Uh, so, was that, you know, is that kind of a arithmetic? Yeah. I, we didn't have a calculator on board. Okay. I used that card, a picture of it, uh, often talking to children in school, uh, elementary school or grammar school, to remind them that they should pay attention to the arithmetic because sometimes you may have to do it the old manual way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tim's question was specifically about the keepsakes. Like, what uh, what did you take from the um, the craft as a keep uh, from the spacecraft from a as a keepsake? Keepsakes, uh, you were they were pretty limited. There was a package mm -hmm. called the PPK Personal Preference Kit. That was a certain uh, volume size and so it had to be small items like i took a good friend a fellow test pilot's a mason ring uh i had a grand a favorite aunt uh, she wanted me to carry her rosary beads and i couldn't fit that so i took the mm -hmm. crucifix off the rosary beads and flew that i flew uh, some of my marine emblems uh and, and naval wings and uh a top sergeant stripe, uh, first sergeant stripe for the Marine Corps, which I later got to uh, present uh, to the commandant and the first sergeant, and a Marine emblem the same way. So, you know, I had those, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, one great question here, um, and it's, what advice do you have for young student hopefuls right now? And should they consider careers in space exploration? Well, I, I don't, I don't try to steer a person to a career. I think it's something they got to find, but hopefully, what they need to work on in in trying to get in the right direction is uh, as early as they can think about the talent they have. Uh, you know, we're all blessed with talent, uh, 
and uh, you, you want to try to match that as best you can with the career path because you'll find that what it takes, the hard work getting through uh, advanced degrees or what, whatever it might evolve to be uh, properly uh, trained and, and ready for a career, uh, it's it's be a lot easier if you're working down a path that is using the natural talent you have. Uh, and, uh, for instance, I, I have one granddaughter who's had trouble, has trouble, has had trouble with arithmetic and math. Mm-hmm. Obviously, she should not think about being an engineer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so, uh, as far as the space program, you know, that's going to have its ebbs and flows. Uh, right now, it's, I would say, sort of hot again. Uh, but there may be over the eons uh, here this you know have ups and downs because uh, there's really been no at least I can see no way of assuring a steady pace uh it it's kind of like what's the next challenge that now spears spears the the funding to proceed and so it's it's really like the aerospace industry in general the military side of course is uh, has its ups and downs depending on what conflicts are going on around the world. Whether aerospace companies that build airplanes or build weapons, uh, how they're funded, the same way, ups and downs, uh, pretty much aligned with uh, what major conflicts are going on. And so uh, uh, it, uh, the aerospace industry, though, uh, overall has uses all kinds of skills, not just engineers. Uh, uh, the premier, I guess, thing, if you if you were geared to do that, of course, is in research, be it medical research or in physics or whatever, because that's, that's kind of a, I'll call it a reasonably steady state uh, uh, kind of business that it's ongoing continuously at that, low, call it lower research level. Okay. Um I do have, uh, I think, just a couple more questions so that we don't have to keep you too much longer. Um, one that has popped up a few times in the chat. Uh, I think you kind of went over it before, but you know, we can ask it directly. Uh, was there, was there a, ever a moment that you thought um, that you would not get back, uh, and what went through your mind? Uh, no, during the flight itself, no. That was, I ne- never had a lack confidence that. Uh, even though we, I knew that, uh, we and collectively we with the team and the ground didn't have all the answers, I was confident in the team we had in the system that had been proven. Every mission had problems before ours. Two more flights almost didn't didn't land on the moon. Apollo 14 and 16 almost aborted. So, But I, I knew this team was working hard to find the answers, so I never gave up. I, with the with the uh, consumable calculations, I knew we would get back to an entry. So my only concern was how would the mothership, the, the, the capsule, how would it function when we abused it for four days, turning it off, which had never been planned to do, uh, would it perform well to get us through entry? So that was kind of a remaining question. As far as you think you can get back, uh, I mean, you you sort of face that before you go. Uh, and it was traditional in uh, fighter squ- I was in two Marine fighter squadrons. And you normally had a friend in the squadron that was his, that you normally your best friend that you sort of told and vice versa that they were going to take care of your family if one day you didn't get back. Uh, and before this flight, uh, Jerry Carr, who was a neighbor of mine and a fellow Marine, uh, was uh, who I designated and showed him, took him to my house and showed him where some of the paperwork was, the life insurance, whatever. Mm-hmm. And so Jerry had the assignment, if I did not get back off this mission, he had the job, again, as the primary guy to worry things for, and make it things easier for my wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, there was, she would have had a lot of other support. There have been other astronauts, other astronaut wives, so I knew there'd be lots of support, not just Jerry, but he was the primary guy I asked to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I'm going to go with one last question here. Um, that just there it is. Uh, you have you've had you had many hours between uh, to talk between the three astronauts who are on the return trip, and can you give us a feel for the a feel of the conversations and the tenor of the crew? 
Uh, and none, there was a lot of, lot of chit chat. Uh, you know, we we uh, talked about the food, and when we were getting ready to try to eat, and how cold it was, and how to how to maybe what best to eat. I, I gave up on uh, the I call it the normal food for most of my four days. I lived mm-hmm. off uh, another area of the pantry that was the snack food. And I, so I ate mostly uh, cookie cubes and bread cubes and peanuts because mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the freeze dry food, uh, the powdered stuff, you needed hot water to make it halfway decent to eat. And we, of course we had none. And uh, I think Jack and Jim, uh, I saw, I've seen pictures where Jack's eating what, what was a, a beef stew, I think, and a, what we call wet packs. But there was a beef stew at about 40 degrees. And the uh, same way Jim had a package of Frankfurters, hot dogs. And uh, without mm-hmm. the hot dog bun, of course, just, just the Frankfurters that he was eating the same way, probably at 40 degrees temperature. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that uh, the, we we, did, we didn't expect really uh, to to have first class uh, four star uh, food accommodations on the flight before we started. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, one last question that kind of again dovetails with uh, this. Um, Eric Briggs is asking: Did you eventually get to see Comet Bennett? No, no, did not. No. Okay. Did not see Comet Bennett. Well, that's for you, Eric. And um, I think that's, um, we, we can end questions there. And, uh, you know, it's been wonderful chatting with you. And thank you so much for your time. And both, uh, both Randy and Fred, um, that was a great talk, Randy. Um, and it really, it, it was just wonderful to uh, hear the, the, the right. research and the stories. And I can hand it back to, to Phil now if he has anything else to say. Okay. Thank you once again, Fred. It was wonderful having you with us. I, I know our members were, were thrilled to have, uh, get a chance to, to hear a bit about history from, from someone who was right in the middle of it. Um, thank you, Randy, for setting the stage with your always encyclopedic knowledge of the Apollo program and, and manned space flight in general. Um, I know we always enjoy hearing you tell NASA tales. Um, Alendria, thank you so much for co-hosting this with me. It's great to, great to be doing this along with uh, Sky News. And for everyone else, just before you sign off, I'd like to remind you there's lots more content still coming from the RASC. Um, This week, you can join us for two of those Insider's Guide to the Galaxy um, sessions. Uh, On uh, Tuesday, Paul Owen's going to take us through an introduction to astrophotography. And on Thursday, David um, Schumann's going to take us through introductory Photoshop to to clean up all those DSLR images of the sky. Um, So that's going to be great. Next week, we have another one of our um, sort of virtual star parties that we're holding on Wednesday night. And of course, you'll want to all come out on the 24th to hear our president, Chris Gaynor, talk about the the history of the Hubble space program. So uh, thanks once again for everyone being here tonight. Thanks again to our special surprise guest, Fred. And this is me wishing everyone a good night and clear skies if you get to get out and do some observing. All right. Take care. Take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Fred. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.